What's good, everybody? This is the Legit Podcast, where we talk about your legit pain, your legit purpose, and everything in between. I'm your host, Bissy, and I do my best to bring guests on here to share how they turn their traumatic and trench moments into the God-given purpose upon their lives and how they are emptying themselves of everything that God has filled them with and to learn how you can do that too. Let's get right into it. What's up, everybody? I have on today John Stongi. John is a follower of Jesus. Yes, yes. Um, John hosts three podcasts. Listen, John, you know, I can't keep up with one, so I don't know how you do three, <laughs> but it's the chapter a day audio Bible, daily devotions with Pastor John, and dwell on these, these things. He's a husband to Andrea and father to four great kids. He holds a degree in Bible education and counseling and is a certified speaker, trainer, and coach with the John Maxwell team and serves as the lead pastor of Core Creek Community Church in Langhorne, Pennsylvania. And John has been, since 1998, he has been serving in full-time Christian leadership. Um, So John, say hi to the people, the legit uh, team, the legit squad. Hello, Legit Squad. Thanks for having me on today, BC. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to have you here to have a conversation with you. Your bio is so rich, and so I want to unpack it. Um, So um, before 1999, uh, 1998, what was the story? Were you always in ministry? Were your parents in ministry? Um, How did you get into ministry? So my parents were not in ministry, and it wasn't until I was in college uh, before my father came to faith in Christ. So prior to that, he wasn't even a believer. Uh, But our family, we had a a grocery store in Scranton, Pennsylvania. We ran a a small family grocery store, and that's what I grew up in. And uh, I I, uh, went to church as a young person. My, My mother was always really, really faithful about bringing us to church. And when I was about 15, that's when I got really serious about my faith in Christ and decided at that point that I wanted to walk with him, I wanted to serve him, but I didn't know what that would look like. And to be honest with you, I didn't want to be a pastor. If you asked me at that point, if I was going to be a pastor, I would have told you no way, because I thought that pastors had a a weird life, always being uh, criticized, always being closely examined. Um, you know, it seemed like they moved around a lot and it seemed like everything they did was fodder for conversation. And I thought, "Ah, I don't think I want to do that. So I planned to be a history teacher and I started, I went to college to be a history teacher, but then partway through college, I was hired as a youth director at a church, not too far from the college. And then the pastor started asking me to speak for him. And once I got a taste for it, there was really no turning back at that point. I thought I can't. I can't run from this any longer. This is what God's calling me to do. So I'm going to do it. Even if there are certain weird aspects to being a pastor, I thought I'm just going to go for it. And now 23 years into doing it, I have to tell you, I love it. There are hard days, but there are more good days than there are hard days. And I'm grateful that I I made that leap. That's that's beautiful. Um, I love that. So it seemed like you were kind of reeled in early. Um, and have you always been in Pennsylvania? Yeah, for the most part, I've lived in different spots in Pennsylvania, but, but yeah, pretty much just a, a a Pennsylvania guy my whole life. Okay, that's that's great. And you have a book coming out in May, um, and it's a thirty-one day challenge to talk to talk to yourself the way God talks to you. Um, yes. Dwell on these things, um, and I'm guessing it was from the foundation of the Dwell on These Things podcast. They kind of go hand in hand. Believe it or not, I wrote the book first and then rebranded my podcast because they they fit so well together. And I decided, let's just call them the same thing so that they could be extensions of each other. So the Dwell on These Things podcast and the Dwell on These Things book are are pretty much hand in hand. And, and both with the mindset of what does it look like to encourage or to be encouraged by how God speaks to us and kind of take that encouragement with us. Because so often we repeat things in our minds and we repeat things in our heart that aren't true and aren't the way that God speaks to us. And so 
uh, I wanted to show people what Scripture actually shows us about how God speaks to us, the things that He teaches us, the fact that we are loved more deeply than we realize, the fact that we can walk by faith to experience joy, and a whole variety of things. And I thought it would be helpful to take a full month to just walk through that and to help people to walk through that. And so that's what the the book that comes out in May, Dwell on These Things, that's what it's all about. And I, I truly hope that it helps others. Yeah, um, and I know it will. Honestly, when I um, started, I guess, having a relationship with God, one of my prayers was, God, let me see you the way, let me see me the way you see me. Um, because I think it really does set a tone for the decisions that you do make the confidence, how you show up in the world, in your workspace, in your relationships and everything. Um, now the book does have, um, there are a couple of topics, um, replace feelings of discouragement with a sense of God, God's goodness, practicing mm -hmm. yourself in the loving way God sees you, exchange negative self-talk um, for positive biblical messages and learn to face the day with hope in your heart. I do want to talk about two of them though. Um, replacing feelings of discouragement with a sense of God's goodness. Um, my question is, you know, already sometimes we <laughs> we question God's goodness, right? Mm -hmm. Especially when we're in, in you know, in cha challenging times. And so how do we replace those feelings when we're already, already questioning God's goodness? That, that is a great question, and I also like the the thing that you said a moment ago about the things that you were praying about, that you would yeah. you were praying that the Lord would help you to see yourself from His eyes. But to your specific question about how do we replace feelings of discouragement with reminders of God's goodness, one of the things that I think is key, every behavior in our lives, so every behavior in my life, every behavior in your life, comes out of something we believe. So uh, I brush my teeth when I wake up in the morning because I know, because I believe that that's good for my teeth. I eat lunch and, because I know that that's good for my body. I try to avoid eating a lot of my favorite snack foods because I know that would be bad for my body. And these are things that come out of beliefs. These are behaviors that come out of our beliefs. And so if I'm going through life perpetually discouraged, and I'm preaching a message to my heart of discouragement, and I'm seeing every day from discouragement, some people might say, all you need to do is change your behaviors to fix that. But I would say that's not the case. What we need to change is our beliefs. What we believe is going to come out in our lives, in our behaviors. And so if I'm discouraged constantly, I have to get to the root of that. I have to figure out what's at the core of my beliefs about myself or about my circumstances, I know one of the things that helps me when I'm going through seasons of discouragement is to remind myself that Jesus is the solution. Mm -hmm. And so I believe he's a solution for all of these things. And so if I'm discouraged, I think one of the problems is I've probably taken my eyes off him and I'm becoming way too consumed with my circumstances. And I'm probably trying to control things that are not in my control, things that I'm supposed to trust him to control. And because I'm not getting the outcome that I thought I could produce, I then feel discouraged. And really, it needs to come back to my belief. If I believe that Christ is sufficient, I can trust him to take care of things that are outside of my control. And I think that that truly does help me with feelings of discouragement. I think it'll help others as well. Yeah, um, totally. I definitely agree with that. And I think one of the things that I've learned to do is look back at you know, how he has been faithful in my life. When I am discouraged, I look back and say, God, you came through this way. And I think sometimes one time I caught myself, like, you know, thinking that God was going to move the same way he moved before. And even yeah. though he did move, it still was different. You know, and I think like, those are the little things that, cause sometimes, you know, we have expectations that he's going to move a, a certain way and he doesn't move that way. And so there's further discouragement. Um, mm -hmm. But realizing that he moves in so many different ways. And, and yeah, I think that's that's really profound. Um, and the second one is practicing yourself in the loving way God sees you. Um, I want to talk about why that is important, because I believe like what if you're just surrounded by, you know, positive people that keep telling you, you know, you know, positive things. But why is it important to actually have that conversation with God and for him to open your eyes, to see, you know, you the way he sees you? 
One of the things that I love about the book of Ephesians is that it gives us a list in chapter one of a variety of ways that that God sees us or certain things that he sees in us that he's producing in us. And they're the opposite of the type of things that you and I tend to tell ourselves. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because when you look in that list, two of the more curious things in that list in Ephesians 1 are the fact that God sees you and me and all who trust in Christ as holy and blameless in his sight. And so I think, all right, I know how many mistakes I've made over the course of my life. I know how many mistakes I make even in a given day. How is it even possible that God sees me as holy and blameless in his sight? Because he knows everything about me. He knows everything I've ever said that was wrong, everything that I've ever done that was wrong, and everything I've ever thought that was wrong. And yet Ephesians 1 very clearly says that, that we are holy and blameless in his sight. And it can be very difficult to see ourselves that same way. But I think that's another belief type question because when we study what is getting what that's what that portion of scripture is getting at, it's basically reminding us that when God the Father looks at you and me, he's not seeing us for who we used to be. He's seeing us as the new creation he has made us in his son Jesus Christ. So when God the Father looks at you and me, if Christ lives within us, the Father sees Jesus. And so as Jesus is holy and blameless, and the Father looks at you and me, and he sees us clothed in the righteousness of Christ, he sees us as holy and blameless in his sight, not because we had any righteousness of our own, but because the righteousness of Christ was given to us as a covering. And, um, and that's a, a true blessing. And it helps me to remind myself of that message, because I can very easily start looking at myself and picking apart my faults or picking apart my mistakes or thinking about my regrets. And it's very helpful to come back to the fact that God sees me as holy and blameless in his sight, not based on anything I've ever done, but based on what Christ has done for me. Mm -hmm. And if I start preaching that message to my heart, it really does put my mind and my heart in a much better place. Yeah, no, that's, that's really, really good. Holy and blameless. Mm -hmm. um, again, it goes back to um, how we show up in the world, how we, you know, go about our relationships, making our decisions, you know, um, that is really good. I, I don't remember, I think it's in Psalm, but there's a verse that also says that he thinks of as, as much as this grains of sand or something like that, that's how much he thinks about us. And mm. I'm like, that's crazy because you can't even finish counting the sand, right? right. So that's <laughs> really, it's just amazing when you think about how much he loves us and how much good he sees in us and he, he the plans that he does have for us. So um, yeah, it's not always easy to see it that way, but like you right. said, once you take your eyes off of that, that's when all those things come in. And so just always being able to go back and, and remind ourselves that that's really good. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think the last thing I want to talk about is facing the day with hope in your heart. Um, mm -hmm. What are practical ways that we can do that? Because, you know, I'm asking this question from a sense of um, sometimes, you know, the Bible also says hope deferred makes the heart sick. So mm -hmm. you're waking up every day and you're hopeful for something. Um, but today is not the day that it happens. Um, mm. How do you practically face the day? It, it's interesting because sometimes when we use the word hope, uh, just culturally or just in the English language, we use the word hope in, in a way that sometimes we mean wish. Mm -hmm. And when you look at how the Bible uses the word hope, it talks about something you can, you can bank on it. It's a guarantee. Okay. So biblical hope is very different from the kind of hope that we might sometimes speak about when I'll say, oh, I hope it stops snowing. So right now where I'm at, it's snowing. And every every minute that it snows, that means more I have to dig. So <laughs> sometimes you might hear me say something like, oh, I, I hope it stops snowing. Then, then I can uh, dig my car out. Um, and what I'm really meaning by that is I wish it would stop snowing. And that's not really, the Bible uses that word completely differently. It, it's talking about the things that we could be absolutely certain of even before we see them with our eyes. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm facing the day with hope, what I'm doing, if I'm doing it the biblical way, is I'm trusting that God works all things together for the good 
of those who love him. And scripture tells us that. And I'm trusting that Christ is going to restore all things. He's going to restore all things about my life. He's going to restore all things about creation, all of these things. And so that's the kind of hope that the Bible's talking about. It's being certain of things that that maybe we don't even see yet. It's It's very much in line with the concept of faith, just being certain of the fact that the Lord is going to bring certain things to pass because he has said so, and not treating it like a wish or a maybe, but treating it like a certainty. And when I walk through each day certain that God's going to do what he said he's going to do, that makes a big difference in my day-to-day quality of life. Because again, it's yet another one of those things that's outside of my control, and I don't have to try and fix everything, and I don't have to try to predict everything. I can trust that God's going to do exactly what he said he's going to do, and that truly does fill my heart with hope. Yeah, there's this song, um, I'm reminded of this song, Done, by One House Worship. Um, that's the worship team at my church. By the time. Oh, awesome. <laughs> yeah, um, but um, Done, and it says that it's already, it's already done. I'm already standing in the promises of God. Um, and I think that, yeah, coming from a place of the fact that it's done, it's certain, it's for sure. Like it's just, you know, yet to manifest and come into the physical. Um, that right. is just really so powerful. And I, I really love that you distinguish, you know, the wish versus the it's it's done, it's certain. So right. yeah, thank you so much, John, for your time, for this space. Uh, really, really appreciate you um, sharing with us, you know, your experience and your um, your knowledge of the word. It, it was really a blessing and I'm sure it will bless um, at least one person that listened. So thank you. Wonderful. Thanks so much for the invitation to to be with you today, BC. I really appreciate it. Yeah. So we have um, a, a rapid fire round just to get to know you a little bit better. All right. Let's do um, it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So first one, something you're looking forward to to this month. Something I'm looking forward to this month. Yeah. Uh, in just a few days, I'm going to make the final payment on my house. I'm paying off my house this month. Congratulations. (laughs) Thank you. I think about it every day. I'm so excited to not have a house payment after this month. I love it. I love it. it. Second one, must have in your car that you do not have. A must have in my car that I presently do not have. Oh, let's see. Let's see. Um, I would say, you know, I noticed that my my windshield is is looking a little foggy. I'd like something that would... uh, kind of just clear my windshield a little bit. And I'm always somebody, I'm really meticulous about my car. I'm one of those people that is, uh, I like to keep it really clean, but you know what I've noticed? My air freshener doesn't, it's not giving off any scent right now. And uh, so I, I, I think I need to get a new one to make it kind of the complete picture, the complete <laughs> driving experience. <laughs> right, 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 got it. Um, and the last one, advice you would give to millennials when it comes to purpose. So, I, that's a great question. And I have, I have something very specific to that, that I I hope would be helpful. Um, When it comes to purpose, when it comes to understanding purpose, you have to understand who you are. Mm -hmm. You have to understand truly who you are. And one thing that I have noticed, so there are many people that fall into the category of millennials that are part of the congregation that I serve as pastor. And one of the things that I, I have noticed as a pattern among millennials and you can correct me if you think I'm wrong on this, but this is my own opinion. I think I'm seeing a pattern of people defining who they think they are by what they choose to do. And when I look at what scripture tells us about our identity, our identity is not wrapped up in in what we do. Our identity is wrapped up in the permanence of who Jesus is. And so I would say, if you want to get a sense of purpose, you have to really understand your real identity. And here's a way to help figure that out. If anything that you would say is your identity can change, Mm. then it's not really your identity. I love it. So th- think of a, think of like a basketball player, you know, somebody that plays basketball for a bunch of years and he's just so good at it. He's so good at it. And, um, and then eventually he gets to the season of life where he has to retire. So if his whole sense of identity was wrapped up in the fact that he was a basketball player, what does he even think about himself when it comes time for retirement? He doesn't even know who he is anymore because he wrapped his identity up in what he does, not who he is. And so I would say, if you want to gain a sense of purpose, you have to figure out 
who you are from a permanent standpoint. And I believe that those answers are reached spiritually. I actually think Ephesians chapter one helps us answer that question because it tells us about things like the fact that you're adopted into the family of God, meaning you're part of God's family forever. So that should be part of your identity. You know, we already talked about that we're holy and blameless in God's sight. So that should be part of our identity as well. And these are things that have permanence. And therefore, I think that they also give us purpose. Yeah, yeah. No, I I totally agree. What a great way to wrap it up. I can go on and on and on about that. (laughs) You know, um, I actually just read a book and it's talking, it's Atomic Habits by James Clear. Um, And the end of it is literally talking about how, you know, in a sense, you need to form an identity with with the person you're trying to become, right? If you see yourself as an, as an athlete, it's the identity. However, that shouldn't be like the permanent the permanent thing, like you said, because what if you can't be an athlete for, for right. some reason, right? Um, and so, yeah, like ditto to what you said and, and thank you so much for that. Um, is there any last words you have for the people? Absolutely. Um, First of all, BC, thank you so much for allowing me to be on your show today. It was truly a privilege, and it's just been a great privilege to meet you as well. And I'm grateful to have the chance to just chat with your listeners. Um, If your listeners, if this is okay, I'd like to give your listeners something free. It's a free download that I have on my website. If you go to desirejesus.com, you'll find a free book, and there's a link for it right at the top of the page. It's a book called The Mind of Christ. And I hope that'll be an encouragement to your listeners. And I think it really goes well, too, with uh, my book that's coming out in May, Dwell on These Things. I think they have very similar concepts in them. But if they'd like a free copy of, uh, of The Mind of Christ that they could download, if they just go to desirejesus.com, they'll be able to grab that right from the top of the page. Thank you so much, John. And and I just want to echo the, the podcast again, since you're listening to this podcast, you should probably jump on, you know, one of the three podcasts, the chapter a day audio Bible, daily devotion to Pastor John, and dwell on these things. I actually listened to two episodes from dwell on these things, the one with Dan Miller and the one yes. with Nikita Koloff. Yeah. Um, they were really, they were really, really good. And the Nikita one was really interesting because he was a wrestler and he took, you know, it was, it was really nice how he took us around. And so, yeah, so you guys should jump on that. I'm going to leave all the information in the show not- notes. Um, thank you once again, John. Thanks, BC. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.